welcome everyone to tonight's presentation by Emma Elizalde. She is the past president of NorCal, Northern California International Dyslexia Association. She currently works as a reading specialist at Town School for Boys in San Francisco. She also has a private practice where she works with students who have language-based challenges. She previously worked as a third and fourth grade teacher at Northbridge Academy. She holds a certificate in education therapy from Holy Names University, a master's in education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and a BA in psychology and education from Mount Holyoke College. So welcome, Emma. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just want to thank Diana for asking me to come back and talk and for PHP for having me back again. So today we're talking about structured literacy and all of the different things that are out there. So Barton, Orton, Gillingham, Slingerland, like, oh my, there's so many things. So understanding kind of what all of those mean and kind of what's at the core of each of them. All right. Diana did a great job of explaining who I am. I kind of have all of these pictures here that explain who I am as a person. I think the first thing that I like to share is that I myself am dyslexic. And so as a kid, I actually went through the Slingerland program as a kid. I also had a tutor who was trained in Orton Gillingham and I kind of have been involved in this world since a very young age. Um, Additionally, I've also done some extra, I've decided to go back to school. So I have a master's degree and a therapy degree, but I'm working on my doctoral degree at the University of San Francisco, just so I can get a little bit more knowledge in how to create more structural change. So before I really get started in talking about structured literacy, I thought I would go over dyslexia in general, just to give us a kind of foundation of what the issues are and why structured literacy is so great to support that. So I'm gonna read a definition and don't worry, my next slide will break that definition up into parts. But I think that IDA or the International Dyslexia Association worked really hard and did a lot in breaking down what dyslexia is. So what is dyslexia? Dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom instruction. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. So here's that definition broken up into its different components. So here at the top, you see this deficit in phonological, the phonological component of language. That piece has nothing to do with the letters and the sounds that go with them. It's all about the manipulation of words and sounds without the visual piece. That then is broken down into the pieces that are related to your reading and your spelling. So you have decoding or reading, being able to break words apart into their syllables, and then even more being able to then blend each sound together and then blend the two syllables or more. Then there's spelling, being able to break apart your word into each individual sound and assigning the correct grapheme or letter letters that go with the sound. And then the components that accuracy being correct and your fluency, the rate, kind of the, the fluidity at which you read. Those components then influence and break down into your comprehension. If you are struggling with reading and you're trying to decode every single word on that page, you're spending all of that energy and your cognitive load thinking, how am I gonna read this word? Maybe by the time you read that word and then read the next word and the next word you get to the period, 
you've just spent so much time trying to figure the word out that you have no idea what you read. So that effortfulness of reading then impacts your comprehension. And then it talked about that reading experience. If it does take you that much effort to read something, you then probably aren't likely to say, oh, I'd really love to read a book now. I know for me, I remember in third grade, really vividly reading the same book, I think the whole year, because it was just so taxing. And I was reading, my mom had given me one of the Wizard of Oz books. I think she gave me like Ozma of Oz. I remember wanting so badly to read this book and I was so excited and interested. But I remember like sitting down on a chair and just being so like, it was just so hard. And I was like, I just don't even want to do this. So it's not like I even gravitated towards reading it. Without that experience of reading, you're then missing out on the vocabulary development and your background knowledge. So you're not getting, you're not hearing or you're not reading yourself the new words that you'll need as you go through the grades. And you're not getting the background knowledge and information that you need to know. Without the vocabulary and background knowledge as you go through school, if you're missing whole, hey, there's holes and you're missing pieces, again, that comprehension kind of falls to the side. Slight bit of neuroscience. Don't worry, it's not too wordy. It's gonna be pretty simple. So you'll see kind of these two pictures of the brain. And this is research done by Sally Shaywitz. And this is kind of a pretty iconic picture of the brain. It's very simple, especially compared to the research that's out right now. But you'll see that in a non-impaired or neurotypical brain, there are certain places that light up when reading occurs. And when someone struggles with reading or maybe has dyslexia, you'll notice that only one of those areas lights up and lights up pretty strongly. Whereas in a, non, a neurotypical person, it's not the big focus. And so what structured literacy does is it takes this component of where reading is kind of firing and connects it to the areas that are kind of silent. So a multi-sensory approach links these different pieces together. So the three main components of a multi-sensory instruction are the auditory component, the visual and kinesthetic. And when you pair all three together, you create actual links in your brain. So maybe my kinesthetic is really strong. And when I write that A in the air and I say A, I'm then like, ooh, I just linked this A, this, this connection in my brain to a part that says the sound and the name of the letter and the shape. So I'm connecting all of these components together at once so that I can strengthen the areas that are weaker. So what is the prevalence of dyslexia? Around 15 to 20% of the population show symptoms of dyslexia. So what that means is the reading is maybe inaccurate, Poor, there's poor spelling, which you know, then leads to poor writing and maybe mixing up of similar words like Pacific or specific. And it occurs in all people of all backgrounds and all intellectual levels and often runs in families. What are some signs from the chat at the beginning of this presentation? I saw a lot of you shared that you have family members with dyslexia. So this probably seems familiar. Sometimes students have a hard time learning their letters and the sounds that go with them, which is a big hallmark of dyslexia. The organization of their writing for, with their spoken language, ability to memorize number facts, reading quickly enough to comprehend, persisting with and comprehending longer reading assignments, the spelling component, Learning a foreign language can be challenging because if you're working on English and that letter sound association isn't quite there yet, having to then assign a different sound to that same letter just adds on confusion. And then maybe doing math problems, the correct operation. So I know I've had students before where I will mix up the problems and I'll have to give strategies of, okay, this is addition and subtraction. Have a strategy for yourself, circle all the addition problems so that they can visually see this one's different. So instead of just quickly going through and making kind of those mistakes. What you can see in the classroom is different for everybody, but some things that I know that I look for and I think teachers are on the lookout for are 
students' abilities of word recognition, their fluency, spelling, writing, grammar, ability to understand text materials, the ability to write an essay, because you know that writing of an essay trickles down to all of those individual components of letter, sound, word, sentence structure, paragraph structure, essay structure, and then the social emotional impact. Often parents will come to me and ask, what's the right school for my kid? Are they in a good space now or should they go somewhere else? And I often link and ask about the social emotional component of how are they feeling about themselves? How do they feel at school? A lot of times students feel less than or dumb. You can tell that they're stressed out. You can tell that they have anxiety. Anytime these things bubble up, I always say it's time to question what supports are in place and how they can support your child so that they aren't feeling those things because of their challenges. So that was my little overview on dyslexia. Now we're gonna talk about the structured literacy piece. What are the pieces that you can put in place to support those challenges? So effective instruction involves structured literacy. And this is a nice graphic that International Dyslexia Association came up with that breaks it down into individual components. And all of these components are all within a structured literacy modality or methodology. So what structured literacy does, it's a systematic way of putting letters and sounds together or word identification and decoding strategies. The parts that it includes are phonology, so the structure of our spoken language, the sound symbol association, so like a says a ah, sometimes. The syllable types, there are six, and I'll talk about them. Not like you need to know them, but I'm going to talk about them because I think they're fun. The morphology component, the meaning behind words, syntax, the grammar, the sentence structure and mechanics, and the semantics, the comprehension component. And a good structured literacy program will cover all of these components. Structured literacy also must have certain things. It must be systematic and cumulative. So if I teach a concept, it doesn't just go away because I taught it once. I teach a concept and then it continues to be reviewed. And once I find a student is maybe really mastering it, maybe it goes away a little, but I always bring it back. It never just disappears. And it adds on. So I'm not just going to focus on short vowels. Oh, you know, they need to know their short vowels are really important. I'm not just going to stay there forever. I'm going to have to add because our language is complex. Structured literacy is also explicitly taught. So that means there's nothing that's kind of left in a question. I'm going to say, this is the letter A. It says A ah, in these situations. It's also diagnostic. Every time somebody is working with group of students or one-on-one, -on -one, you're thinking, where were they successful and where were the challenges? I'm gonna look at those challenges and I'm gonna make sure they're in my lesson the next day or the next time I see this student. And these kind of all work together. And a good structured literacy coach or tutor or teacher will think about this as they teach and go through their lessons. So what are some of the methodologies? So I put a bunch on here because there are a bunch out there. So we have, I put Orton Gillingham at the top. It's kind of like the grandfather of all of the structured literacy approaches. It was originally designed for a one-on-one, -on -one, but can be adapted for group work. I think that it's hard when you see all of these different names and different systems to know which one do I choose? There's so many out there. Which one is the best? And it's really hard to say what's the best, especially because it's different for every kid. Some kids really thrive in one, another kid might not and thrive in another. 
But I always ask, what was the training involved for the person who will be working with my child? Was it a weekend? Was it a week? Was it a month? Were they required to work with someone to shadow and give them feedback on their lessons and the work that they do? Or did they just kind of have to like watch a video or learn really quickly and then be set free with a notebook or a you know textbook that you know says flip to page 52 when you're on short A? So I would say that Orton Gillingham, I have I think two or three trainings in. I know about it because it's like I said, like the grandfather. It's where everything originated. And all of them, they're so similar, but they're all kind of based off of that think that Orton Gillingham thinking and idea of. And I'd say that Orton Gillingham, I've learned a lot. I like to, you know, when I work with people who are maybe new to structured literacy, but they're supporting and reading, I like to be able to like convince them to get trained in something. And Orrin Gillingham is a really great training. It's about a week long for a basic training. People understand a little bit of neuroscience and then people get some practical things that they can take into the classroom. But I do have a lot of people who come from a week long training and go, I'm still kind of confused. I'd say week long trainings. Wilson are usually a couple days, sometimes a week. Barton has online trainings. Lindy Mood Bell, I know you can send students to kind of their like campuses or like their buildings that they're housed in. I've had friends who've been Lindy Mood Bell tutors as like a college job in the summer. You do follow a textbook, you kind of flip to the page that works for you. But then there's also people who are trained in Linda Mood Bell who have good, have the actual training and are able to kind of pair it with the other things that they know how to do. Spire is a, tra a program that I know San Francisco Unified uses. The training, I believe, is a weekend. I think there's a lot of computer heavy components. And I don't think it leaves the person being trained able to really design or write a lesson that is focused specifically on their student or their group of students. Slingerland is where I have the most training in and I think does a nice job of kind of breaking the pieces that are important in structured literacy up that are really obvious. Slingerland training is four weeks and it's five days a week, all day. You watch an expert teach, you then have an opportunity to work with a student one-on-one -on -one and get feedback on your lessons. I have found it so helpful to be able to have a mentor to coach me through how to teach what is not necessarily easy, but complex. I was out of work the other day, we were away for a wedding and my coworker was like, oh, I'm really excited. Can I teach your lesson? I went, totally go for it. I'll walk you through it. I'll give you an easy lesson. And I got a text while I was away. He went, oh my God, I just did it. But whoa, that was harder than I thought it would be. And so while it might look easy on the outside, there are so many components that go into it. If we think about all those components of structured literacy, there's a lot you're really thinking about and designing for, especially when you're thinking about all of those different students. So today I'm going to really hone in on Slingerland and what that looks like. But they're all very similar. They all share a lot of the same components. I'd say two big names are Slingerland and Orton Gillingham. Major differences are that I'd say that one goes down, like one focuses on like reading one day and spelling another, or if you're a really fast and efficient tutor, 50-50 in each, and one kind of mix and matches. But it also depends on the tutor you have and how they design their lessons. I know I've dipped into both design lessons, depending on the student I'm working with. Emma, so, before yeah. you move on, um, mm -hmm. somebody has a different name, um, Sunday, S-O-N-D-A-Y. Is that one you've heard of? I have not heard of Sunday. Okay. Um, it has not come up in my conversation with school district. Well, I'm, I work at a private school, but... Um, I work with a lot of people who work at San Francisco Unified. 
and who work across districts in the Bay Area. And that one has not come up. Mm, okay. All right. Um, we'll hold off on the Q&A because I think they're asking for recommendations and your opinions on things. So we'll hold off on that. Great. I would say a Slingerland trained person has a lot of background information and knowledge and had some good training. An Orrin Gillingham person, I think, has good training and sometimes is left with questions. Someone trained in real Wilson, not foundations, I think also has really good training. Spire, I'd say, is less so, very short. Linda Mood Bell, I do see kids who go in there with who make progress, but I'm not sure what happens kind of on the other end once they graduate and leave. And Barton, I know, is online and it sounds very flexible. Their website is kind of older. Um, but people do really like it and it seems accessible. So what do these programs look like? So I am gonna kind of talk about it from a Slingerland lens, but again, they're all very similar. So Slingerland was designed from Orton Gillingham. And like I said, Orton Gillingham was originally one-on-one -on -one, and Slingerland does, Beth Slingerland designed it to be for a classroom application. So there's three main components that you're looking for in structured literacy. And sometimes they kind of only hit two and that's all right. The two that are most hit are the auditory component. So what you hear and then write. So maybe that's the sounds, the words, phrases, sentences, paragraphs. So building on those small components. And then the visual side, what do I see? Can I say the sound of the letter I see? Can I break apart the words? Can I read the phrases and learn about phrasing and then apply that to my sentence reading and passage reading? An additional component that some structured literacy programs hit and some kind of like say, but it's not always heard, is a handwriting component. So again, that explicit instruction of how are these letters formed? Where do they start? If you're writing and every time you get to the letter B and you don't know where to go, and sometimes you start at the top and sometimes you start in the middle and sometimes you start at the bottom, you've just maybe lost all of your thought because you got stuck on one letter. So to be sure to teach explicitly how every letter is formed so you can have that fluidity when you write. And again, when you teach that letter, teaching the sound with it. And then practicing the letters and even practicing some connections. So I'll start with the handwriting component because that's usually where Slingerland starts. And it's this the handwriting piece is, I think really it's it's quick. When I teach at the school I work at, I do a handwriting boot camp at the beginning of the year. And we kind of go through the letters quickly, trying to review. I work in second grade. So in first grade, I know that they've been working on it with their reading teacher, so it's kind of review. But the teacher will kind of demonstrate how the letter is formed. So, and say, I'm gonna start at the top, I'm gonna go down two spaces, retrace up and curve around back to my baseline. Then the student would repeat, and then the student practices. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. So a student will get a, maybe a large piece of paper, maybe a less large piece of paper, but I know I've taught on like 11 by 17 and it really makes that muscle movement input that it makes students use that muscle movement. Getting to that kinesthetic component, that muscle memory. Ooh, I'm pairing the muscle memory saying H, H. And students will trace this letter. Once they trace it, they'll try it on their own, having the guide next to them to look at and having it on the board. Once they've tried it on their own, they cover up and try it without seeing anything. After you teach this letter H, you go, this letter H has a keyword, it's house, and the sound it makes is <sighs> So then they write H, house, I've said the letter name. I've said a keyword in the sound. If I can't remember the sound, but I'm really strong in my kinesthetics, I go H. And because I'm doing it all simultaneously, I'm making those connections in the brain. And because this one is strong, it's lighting up the piece that's weaker 
and drawing it to the front. Spelling. So this is that auditory component. The piece where the teacher, the tutor will say the sounds or the letters or words and the student will write it down. So students are ex again, explicitly taught how to break words apart. And of course you'll start simple. Maybe you'll break the word cat apart, thinking about its individual sounds, k, a, t, and then writing those together. But then words get more complex, breaking it into the syllables, then breaking each syllable into a phoneme or the sound, and then putting the letter that goes with that sound. I'm gonna do a demonstration of a word. If we were all kind of together, we could do it together. If you wanna do it at home, you can, but I won't know if you do or you don't. So let's say our word was stack. We'd all say stack. I'm gonna show you a visual. I'd say, what's my first sound? S. Sometimes students need uh, tiles to support their holding of information. Let's pretend like a student might need that. We'd go stack, s. Oh, I know that's an S. I'd write that S in the air and then I'd pull it down on my chart. Stack, s, t, next sound. Bring down my T. Stack, a, a, bring down my A. Stack, k. Well, I have some choices, but I know this is a short word and it's coming right after a short vowel, so I need to use CK. Letter tiles are really helpful for some students. I often though graduate my students from letter tiles so that they can do this in the air so that one day when they are sitting down and writing in a paper or maybe just a sentence, they can go, hmm, I need to figure out that word. How can I tap out my sounds or how can I write it in the air first before putting it on paper so that I don't make a mistake or I can just use my tools. And I know I do see kids sitting at their desk and I teach them to tap out sometimes, which is from Morton Gillingham and it's not from Slingerland, to tap out maybe quietly at their desk. So maybe no one sees, but it's a tool that they have to help them. Okay, what is that sound? It's a T. Writing individual words is great, but in reality, we have to write more than just individual words. We have to write full sentences and paragraphs and essays. And there's a written expression component. So teaching first the smallest unit of sight, sound, and feel. So like, ah, how does I, how do I, what's it look like? What's it sound like? And what's it feel like to write it in the air, but also to form it with your mouth? Having these strong foundations can allow you to do things that are more challenging, like writing a sentence or writing a paragraph. So whoever your child is working with will be thinking, what is my student working on and where do we need to go? Many of the students I work with are still working on sentence structure. What does a simple sentence look like? Once we've kind of mastered that, well, let's go to compound sentences and get a little fancier. Maybe complex sentences. And maybe, how do you even structure a paragraph? What does that look like? Let me tell you how a paragraph is supposed to be structured. So here's an example of dictation, what some people might do in a lesson. Often my dictations, especially in what I, I do 45 minutes of tutoring. In 45 minutes of tutoring, I can often get to a sentence but doing a dictation really requires a good hour and it requires five days in a condensed period of time. So I usually do them over the summer with students that I work with. It's also a component of Slingerland and I don't believe that it's a component of Orton Gillingham. I think Orton Gillingham might just be sentences or a couple sentences. I don't know if they go into paragraph form. I think they teach paragraphs kind of in a different way that is also structured and explicit. I think it's just different. So this is an example of how I would then plan or what a dictation might look like. 
So these are the concepts that I have taught. So above are each of my vowel patterns, short vowels, silent E, R controlled, stressed syllable, double vowel, and final stable syllable. Now, this is a student who I had already worked with for a year and knew a lot. But again, there's that systematic component and that I'm keeping track of what my students know and I'm adding to it. Other things that I have taught were some letter combinations, some spelling rules, et cetera. From all of that, I decided to write this paragraph for them to I dictate and they'd write down. So something I thought about was, okay, we've worked on compound sentences, we worked on complex sentences, we're working on transitions, and I want them to be able to write an opinion paragraph. Well, before they write their own, I'm gonna write one and have a study it. Let's study, what does the first sentence do? Oh, it's introducing my opinion. Okay, what happens? Ooh, I see I have a transition. So my intro, the, big, the best game to play at recess is tag. So all these words I've chosen are words that they can spell and words that we might be studying so that they can spell them later. I'm looking at the transitions, we're studying, we're looking at any evidence that I might put in, we're studying the suffixes that might be happening. And then we spend the next week or five lessons having lessons that incorporate all of these components. I have the word wiggles. I want them to know that you need to double your consonant in the middle. So we're gonna practice lots of words like that. Not necessarily that word, but words really similar. And the first time I did a dictation assignment, I was very nervous because I was very reluctant to do it because it's a lot of planning. I think something that people don't always think about is that in planning a structured literacy lesson, you really have to think deeply. What does this student know? What are they struggling with? Where do I start? And how do I build to get them in a place that I want them to be? Writing a whole paragraph for me was so difficult. And I was like, oh, I really don't want to do it. But I was so impressed. I did it with two students a couple summers ago. And I was like, whoa, they really like figured out what I wanted them to learn. And then after I did the dictation, I saw it still there. So it is impressive and important to see how all of these small components build and build and build and help students hold on to information and then show what they know. So now we're going to the other side. No longer am I saying things. Now students are seeing and then reading. So a lot of times you'll hear the word decoding. I know in Orton Gillingham, they call it syllabication. So breaking words into their syllables. And before you even decode a word, you're studying each sound. I mean, I've got my cards right here. So you're showing a card, you're saying the letter, the keyword and the sound. You're even writing it in the air. As students get more advanced, sometimes you can just do quickly the sound and flash through the cards and they just say the sound, eh, buh, k. After you go through that individual sound, you build to a word and you learn the different syllable types or the different vowel graphemes. And then after you do an individual word, you then get bigger to the phrases and sentences. So there are six types of vowel graphemes I'll breeze through this since it's fun, but I don't expect you to necessarily come away with this being able to teach somebody. Like I said, the best trainings are at least a week long, and this is just an hour, an hour and a half. So short vowels are most common, that closed syllable, a, a, i. Open syllables are really common. There's vowels at the ends of stressed syllables that say their name and vowels at the ends of unstressed syllables that say sounds like, oh, uh, like in America. Although my mentor would probably be very unhappy that I just said sounds like, uh, because I can't say an unstressed syllable by itself because that in itself is stressed. But anyways, 
Um, vowel, consonant, sound, and e are controlled double vowel and final stable syllables. Here's an example of words that might be given to a student. Students look at the vowel patterns and then they learn when you look between vowel patterns, there are specific places you divide. And once they know those systems, they can put that into place in most words. Even if the word isn't, is kind of funky, you can kind of get it based off of what you've read. Like, I don't say polite, I say polite, but I can kind of get polite, polite, oh, polite. These programs also work on students' fluency, reading in phrases, understanding what a phrase is. Again, understanding what a phrase is is important for reading, but it's also important to know what a phrase is when you write and to understand what a sentence is. So this allows students to apply their decoding abilities and skills, and it supports their comprehension. As you read with students, you can ask them questions. Hey, that pronoun he, who is it referring to? Oh, the dog that was mentioned earlier? Great, let's keep going. With reading comprehension, these programs often have students make predictions maybe answer some comprehension questions about the text. Maybe analyze the paragraph itself of, hey, we've been writing paragraphs or hey, we've been studying compound sentences. Did you see any? What did you notice? And it also helps you understand, you know, using a mentor text to help you outline and summarize and then write your own report based off of that. So I really like looking at examples to see well, okay, you just kind of gave me examples of what structured literacy looks like, but how does that look like with different students and across different you know, environments? So I have a handful of different student work in different environments to give you an example of progress students make and kind of give you a sense of what this looks like in reality. So sample A is a general education classroom and it's in a small group. This is a second grade student and the whole class gets phonics support four times a week for about 20 minutes. The class is around 23 kids and it's me and sometimes a floating teacher. Then the student also gets small group work around three times a week. It's like two kids to one adult, and it ranges from 15 to 30 minutes. So a good amount of phonics is in the whole class. So everybody's getting it. And then they're getting a little bit of outside support as well. So this is a beginning of the year assessment. You can see here that he's starting to really you can pull out a good number of sounds and then kind of as the test goes on, you can see that things get more challenging. And as the test goes really on, you see that all of a sudden it's just kind of falling apart and they're really struggling. This was a lesson that was taught to the whole class. As you see here, we're starting from the smallest unit, just the letter sounds. You can see him working here. You can see that you know he's still working on some letter formations, and it's still in it's October. It's hard in a class of twenty three to make sure every kid is on task and doing what you want. It's hard to make the corrections you might want to make. Here you'll see that we're writing words and adding suffixes to them. This student. All of the answers get put on the board for them to look at. Sometimes he misses what the correct answer is. And sometimes he can check his work or he does it correctly. And then you see that after we write our words, we write a sentence. So there was a frosty shake in the stuffed fridge. This is a small group lesson. Again, you see we start with the individual sounds. He's pretending like he can decode them, but it's not a word. So don't, don't think he's decoding that. Then we're writing our words and then a full sentence. Even though it's two on one, 
he, you see that he does have better handwriting, but there's still mistakes that slip in that are hard to get to sometimes when you don't have a lot of time. Student B. So this student was in an intensive summer school. So that was three hours or two and a half hours of learning. And it was five days a week of structured literacy. And this is a student who's entering fifth grade. So this is their first day spelling test. You can see that they have a lot of their sounds represented, but they're having a hard time with maybe their vowel patterns or when there's multiple choices, picking the right one. Again, these are some challenges that this student has. And again, looking, so she was able to keep it together for the words, but once it got to phrases and sentences, you can see how much challenge it was for her to hold the whole sentence in her head, think about how to form the letters and spelling. All of that additional load is visible in her, in her work. And this is the last day spelling test. In this program, she learned cursive and she learned to segment her sounds. You'll also see here that she's decoding. She's correcting herself. Here you can see she's corrected the word forlorn two times. She's going, oop, F-R, ooh, that's not what I wanted. Okay, F-O-R, ooh, that connection maybe she didn't like. So she tried it again. And once she finished, she wasn't done. She checked her work and made sure she spelled what she wanted to spell. And this is kind of the, the back of the test. You can see that, yes, she is making some mistakes, but she's able to correct them herself. And here we're at the end with some sentences. We don't see the same student at the beginning of the summer program. Yes, she's still making mistakes, but she can persevere and she can hold that information in her head and she has tools. And with those tools, she is much more successful and we don't see that internal struggle come out on the page. We can see that confidence and we can see the tools that she's using. Student C. So this is a student who is at a specialized school. They're in third grade and they have structured literacy five days a week for an hour and a half. This is kind of like the most amount of support a student could get. Here's their first day spelling assessment. You can see that you know, in hibernate, he gets a lot of the sounds, but he's missing his middle vowel pattern and he doesn't get the last silent E. Dispute, explode. These, you can tell he's using the phonetic piece explode. He's missing the vowel, but there's so much that's still there. And then this is a lesson in October. Again, you'll see that we're starting from the smallest, or we're practicing our letters. I knew that we needed to practice capital J because it was in our sentence. We needed to practice the BL connection because that's hard, and SNA. Then, single unit of sound. I'm saying sounds and they're writing the letters that go with them. You'll see here that there's like stars and underlines and squigglies. That's because I'm giving them cues. I said, write what spells. He wrote C, K, C, K. And I'm saying, put a squiggly line under the one you'd use at the end of a short word after a short vowel. He puts a squiggly and checks the board to see if I did that too. And I say, put a shooting star over the one that's most common. The line O, C is most common. So he puts a shooting star over the C. Then I say, put a line under the one you used before an E, I, N, or Y. And most kids always go, that's the last one left. And then they put an underline. But you see, we kind of do all of the individual sounds that are gonna be represented in the words we spell. We spell individual words, focusing here on those last digraphs and trigraphs that are sometimes hard to choose. And then we're working on a sentence. The black raven had to defend his chicks from the snake. Here you'll see he wrote this word chops. 
That's a way for him to check his work. I let him write. I will let the class write. And it's a classroom of 10 to 12. I let them write. And then they do chops. And then they can say, I'm ready for you to check my work. But he's going through, did I really have everything I want? Even with the word defend, he wrote it and he didn't, I can tell he stopped and didn't even finish because his D would have had a nice connecting stroke. He stopped before that would happen and goes, I made a mistake. He rewrote it, breaking it apart into its chunks, its syllables. And then he decoded it to make sure he really had what he wanted. And he did the same with snake. He noticed he put a C and he goes, well, I can't have an E afterwards, or it would say, it must be another pattern. So here he's even able to check his work. Because I worked with this student for so long, I have a lot of his work samples. But this is end of year spelling assessment. It's kind of small, but he got 100%. At the beginning of the year, we saw this student really struggle. His letters aren't full formed the same every time. I mean, look at this B versus this B. They're not the same. Versus a student who is writing on regular college rule paper and using all of his skills to make sure he's spelled every word correctly. Like I said, these programs teach in a structured manner. We then talked about how to write a paragraph in a structured way. You have your first sentence, which shares your opinion. Then you have reasons. Then you have you go into why your reason is important because you want to win your argument. And I'm going to read his paragraph because I think it demonstrates how he used that structure and really thrived with being able to write a strong paragraph. The best foods. One of the best foods is a burger. One reason is one reason is it is yummy. It is super juicy. When you bite into it, comma, the juice comes out. Another reason is it is tender. As you cut inside, the middle is pink. The cheese is also good. Sometimes the cheese is stringy. For example, as you bite into the burger, the cheese stretches. Similarly, it is melty. At the same time, when you get your burger, the cheese is melting off. One of the best foods is a burger because it is yummy and the cheese is good. Now, I didn't just give him a piece of paper and say, go. We really talked about the structure of this and we used a graphic organizer to hold our ideas so that we weren't just writing and going, where am I in this paragraph? And I'm not really sure what to write next. So giving these tools, teaching explicitly, can result in really strong writing. We were obviously using transitions and that was a big focus of this. So we kind of maybe overused them, but he had a sheet of paper with transitions on it that he could look to and go, I need to come up with a new idea. I want to transition my thought. What could I use? Oh, it's right there. I don't have to just come up with it and retrieve it. So what can you do as a parent or an adult supporting a student who's struggling? Emma, before you move on, a quick question about your examples. One parent was asking um, for clarification that these students are reading already, right? These were the third grade, fifth grade age um, students. None of, I mean, they all struggled reading. The last student I showed started third grade not reading at all. Mm -hmm. um, okay. My fifth, the fifth grader that I worked with, um, she could read a little bit. And the second grader is a little bit behind grade level. So we kind of started with a little bit behind, more behind, most behind. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think if you can see a little behind is getting a little support and making little progress. More behind got a lot of support and made good progress. And most behind got the most support and has made the most progress. So what can you do as someone supporting a student who's struggling? So a lot of times people ask, well, what questions am I supposed to ask a possible tutor? And I know understood, I think .com or .org is a really good resource that has really good questions to ask. And I kind of pulled some from there. And I also kind of included some of my own. 
I like to ask people, how long have you been tutoring? What qualifications, certifications, credentials, or trainings do you have? And what methodologies do you use? You kind of want to look for those buzzwords, Orton Gillingham, or something that's like Orton Gillingham. I know that I recently went to a meeting where I believed that the support this student was getting wasn't sufficient. And I said, are any of the methodologies you use based off of Orton Gillingham? And the tutor said, wow, you know, that's actually a, a word I keep hearing, but I have no idea what it means. I should probably do some research. I mean, that to me was my first question. And it was the first answer I needed to know this isn't the right support for this student. I also like asking, have you worked with students who struggle with this before? Or is this your first time? How are you gonna assess my students' needs and where to begin your work? I know as someone who's been doing this for the last eight years, I've struggled. At the beginning, I struggled with where do I start? They don't all start at the beginning. Some of them are in the middle. And how do I assess where I'm gonna begin? Maybe your student has attention issues. Do you, you support that? How do you support that? What's your experience? Talking about the communication you have with your teachers and with your tutors. Are you gonna reach out to me and tell me how my child is doing? Or do I have to ask you? Are you gonna to come to my parent-teacher conferences? Is that an option? Will you communicate with teachers? Is that via email? Is it a phone call? And then kind of maybe the nitty gritty pieces like the business operational components. What's their availability? What are their hours, their price, cancellation policy, makeup sessions, and any additional fees? I know some people will charge for driving or materials. Um, I know some people who don't do makeup sessions. I traditionally have not done makeup sessions. I've kind of started adding that in. Um, some people do. It's also very hard to find qualified tutors. Even in making this presentation, I had a hard time thinking of what could I give to people that would be helpful. Here are a few websites that can help you out. First is Association of Educational Therapists. I'm an educational therapist. I've often used the word glorified tutor, but I think I've used that in the past and I don't think it's an appropriate description of what an educational therapist is. An educational therapist has clear, explicit training in reading, writing, and math. And they're coming to a session with pl tutoring plans. What are we going to do? I see that you have a deficit and we're gonna close that gap by doing X, Y, and Z. And I'm gonna make it structured and I'm going to systematically teach you the skills in order for you to gain knowledge and skills. Versus a tutor, who's maybe just come in to help with homework, doesn't really have a good background in students that struggle and are kind of just there for a little bit of support. Another place that you can find referrals, but it's not the strongest, is the Northern California branch of the International Dyslexia Association or NorCal IDA. We have a referral search on our website. It's an Excel document that I don't know when the last time it was updated was. It's there, it is a resource. Kind of building on that is the Center for Effective Reading Instruction or SERI, which is the International Dyslexia Association's like big like project that they're working on for finding referrals throughout the United States. They break down their support based off of an assessment they've created. They want people to take their courses to be certified to say that, oh, I know enough that I'm class a classroom teacher certification, most basic level, that I'm a dyslexia interventionist, that I have had training and I'm practicing, that I'm a dyslexia specialist, that I have extensive training and I've gone through their program. I have not done this, so you would never find my name on this. So, it's some people are there, some people aren't, but it is a resource to help you if you're kind of lost and need a place to start. It is categorized by state. California is a large state, so you do have to scroll through to find where you're located. And then I think what 
happens most is kind of word of mouth. I have people often ask me like, do you have availability? Do you know anyone who has availability? I found your name on this website. Are you free? What do you know? And unfortunately at this point in time, I feel like so many people are booked, but every day I am hearing about new people who are available. Either maybe they retired and they have all this availability or they switched careers and they stopped teaching in the classroom and they've gone to tutoring. And Emma, before you move on there, um, there's a question relating to this about how would a parent really know that like, I know confidently that I need to go out and get an educational therapist or a tutor. What, what can you share that can help them understand the criteria for deciding and pulling the trigger on, on that type of expense? Yeah, it is a big expense to make for your family. I would say looking at going to a parent teacher conference and asking your teacher and specialist to really be honest with you. Where is your student at school? How much progress do they really need to make in order to be where they want to see you? How do they feel about school? If they're not feeling good about school, if they're complaining about going to school, if they say they hate school, they're crying, they're showing you signs that something's not right, that is a big trigger of I should do something. But I also say to people, if you got a cancer diagnosis, and of course, dyslexia is not cancer, but if you got a cancer diagnosis, would you wait a year to get treatment or would you get it right away? Because early intervention is always the best because you can fill in those foundational holes to build. If your student is older, you want to get as much support as soon as possible. I had someone tell me in the realm of psychology, not related to dyslexia at all, but that the sooner you identify something and get support to fill in the foundation, less, it's less money later on. So the more you put off getting support, the bigger the problem gets and the more expensive that problem becomes because now you have less time to kind of fill the gaps. Right. I think that's that's great advice. And and just from our perspective at PHP, we we sometimes get families coming to us in the high school environment when a child's in high school and saying at that point, their child, their self-esteem is so low from all the trauma that they've been experiencing at school, all the negative experiences, lots lack of success, maybe people la- labeling them as lazy or not working hard enough when they really, truly are working really hard on trying to do better, um, but just aren't being supported the right way. And that kind of trauma can add to um, lack of motivation to go to school, um, absenteeism and things like that. And um, so, yeah, you know, things can snowball beyond just through the academics. It can actually start to really affect a child's mental health if things are not addressed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Often parents will ask me, well, what can I do? Like, maybe my kid's in tutoring, maybe they're not, but I can tell that something else needs to happen. I gave you a presentation on what structured literacy looks like. I do not expect you to now be an expert to do that at home yourself. But it does give you a lens into if you're, you know, in the next room or maybe in the same room while your kid's in tutoring on Zoom or at the kitchen table with their tutor, you can start thinking, is this what's, what it looks like? Or am I paying for something that doesn't match this? And is that really what my child needs? But at home as a parent, what I say is read. There are lots of things that you can read with your child. If they're really at the beginning and struggling, decodable text. Maybe if you're moving beyond that, or even if you are reading that, and that's really hard for your child, take turns reading. Hey, why don't you read a sentence and then I'll read the rest of the page? Or why don't you read the page, one page and I'll read another page? Or you read a paragraph, I read a paragraph. And slowly kind of give them more responsibility as they build their stamina. Because as they're reading, they're putting so much effort. And then you're giving them a break to kind of relax. It's kind of like if you're like weight training and you know your trainer's like, okay, you're gonna deadlift. 
they wouldn't be like deadlift 30 times in a row. Like do 10 and let's take a break. Then now do 10 again. Let's take a break and let's do 10 and let's take a break. And then the next time they go, we're going to up the weight, do 10, take a break. So each time you're taking turns, maybe you're upping the weight or you're increasing how much they're reading. And maybe, you know, for a month, they're reading a sentence and you're finishing the page. Then maybe you're seeing their stamina grows and maybe you say, hey, why don't you read two sentences or could you read to this part? And then I'll read the rest and see how that helps. Listening to books is also a great option. I have this really nice retro image of a tape player, um, but listening to books on tape or PDF or audio or whatever you call it. Oftentimes students are really interested in books that they can't access by their reading skills. So listening to books at their interest level gives them the vocabulary that they need and allows them to develop that love of learning and stories. Oftentimes students do love stories, they just can't access them. And what I always say is practice, 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 practice. The, I can totally tell when my students have practiced reading at home and when they haven't. I can tell you all of my tutoring students which ones have practiced and which ones haven't based off how much progress they make. And it's really obvious. It's amazing how much just that practice can do. And then discuss the books. Hey, tell me what you read about. What was your favorite part? Who was the main character? Did you like them? Were they kind of lame? And if you really wanted to push them, you could have them write about it. Maybe write about those questions. You just asked them, what was your favorite part? My favorite part was whatever. Other things you can do to support your child at home is finding a good place to work creating realistic, oh, going back to finding a good place to work. I know sometimes, you know, you're making dinner, they're doing their homework at the table. Maybe that's not their best place to work because maybe they're like, mm, like what are you making over there? Or can I have a bite to eat? Or, oh, I'm distracted. And oh my God, the TV's on. Finding a place that works for them. Maybe it's less distracting. Maybe it's in their room or maybe that's not a good choice for them. Or maybe they are at the kitchen table because they want, hey, I need your help. Creating realistic goals. Okay, you have this many assignments. Realistically, what can we do? Making a schedule. Oh, okay, you got soccer on Tuesday and ballet on Wednesday. So those aren't good days to pile on the homework, but you know, Mondays are pretty free. Maybe we can do a little extra work on Mondays. So on Tuesday night, we just have to do a little bit. Plan and take breaks. We're going to read three pages and then we're going to take a break. Maybe what is that break? You're going to run up and down the stairs, run down the hallway. You're going to go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, watch TV. What's that break look like? And use tools, assistive technology, just like Diana said. There's lots of assistive technology that's out there that students can use. Text to speech, having the words read out loud, speech to text in their writing, talking and it being written down for you. Visual timers. Okay, you have 30 minutes. This is what it looks like. You need to work actively for 30 minutes. As the timer goes, you're watching them work actively. And then the timer goes off, you go, oh, you worked actively for 30 minutes. Great, time for your break. But of course, if they don't work actively for 30 minutes, you go, oh, I saw that you were messing around for 10. 10 more is added on. And then there's apps out there for minimizing distractions. I know my professor at Harvard, he um, had ADHD or has ADHD, and he had all these apps that would take away the advertisements. Because I know, you know, when a shoe ad pops up or like the cute sweater I saw on email today and is now all over everything I look at, I go, ooh, I should click on that. And then by the time I realize it, I'm like 30 minutes into like what sweaters I might want to buy and when I should buy them, because when I get my paycheck or whatever. So minimizing those distractions so you can really focus on your work. And now I'm open for questions if you have any. All right, that was so much great information. Thank you. Um, kind of on that, last topic you were you were kind of talking about assistive technology options um 
what are some books or series that are samples of decodable text? I mm-hmm. guess that's reading material. Yeah. Um, examples starting at the most basic are Bob books. Those are really great. Um, I also like a series called Primary Phonics. And Flyleaf is a publishing company that last year did have their decodable text available online for free, but I'm not sure if they've continued that, but they have really pretty art and they kind of make it look a little bit more realistic. Um, And there's one that I can't remember the name of, but I know I've been looking into with my colleague. It's based out of the UK and it's a little bit more sophisticated, but from what I've seen, it's not necessarily, it doesn't look as decodable as I would want it to. Okay, what was that third one? I was trying to write these down. Bob Books, Primary Phonics, and... Flyleaf Publishing. Fly, F-L-Y-L-E-A-F. Okay. Okay, great, thank you. And I'll try to send some of these these things in the email when I send it to families. All right, Uh, here's a question. What would you recommend if the school used Barton and Wilson for the child and the progress is slow. The child is on an IEP. Can we have the district pay for a tutor? I guess those are two separate questions. So why don't we answer the first one? If the progress is slow with those two methods, Barton and Wilson, what would you recommend first? Um, I would recommend asking how many times a week are they receiving these instructions? I'd say that it doesn't hurt that there's two different methodologies in place because they're probably similar, but it also doesn't always make sense to use two methodologies if they're at the same school. Um, so I would say how many times a week are they getting support and how long is the support? So if it's twice a week for 15 minutes, well, that's not enough support. Um, and then you're going, you need to pay for outside support because what you're providing inside isn't enough. How big is the group that they're receiving support in? Is it full class? Is it 15 kids? Is it two? Kind of what what attention is your child getting? Or is it that there's a paraprofessional in the room who's providing hours, but they're working with another student one-on-one and just their body's in the room. So they're providing hours, but aren't really working with your child one-on-one. So I would ask, how long are the sessions and how often are they? Mm -hmm. And if those kind of seem like they're not enough, asking about further support Mm -hmm. and then moving on to maybe outside support. Right. Because the IEP is a changeable document. And although the team is required to meet once a year, a parent can certainly ask the team for an earlier meeting to address their concerns, uh, maybe look at the goals. Maybe do we need to add another goal to help drive the program, support the addition of more time and hours, or maybe smaller sessions. Like you said, if there are a lot of kids in a room and you're trying to you know, um, monitor, it's a lot more difficult. The quality of instruction may be compromised um, with less monitoring and a smaller environment, maybe one to two, one to four, a smaller group may be beneficial. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. All right. Um, we have a question in the chat and it was about, let's see, um, there were some some commentary about memory um, being kind of the comorbid condition with dyslexia. And so a family asked, uh, my child has ADHD and dyslexia and a poor memory. He also struggles with letter formation and dysgraphia. Oh, dysgraphia. Do you have any tips for those children with memory issues or struggles with difficulty writing? And is it common to have an issue with memory problems? So I think a big part of dyslexia is this retrieval piece. Someone once described it to me as your brain's a filing cabinet and you don't put everything back in the right place. So when you go back to look for it, it's not where you thought it was. And that makes it difficult. With Slayerland, how I described it, what's really nice about it, whether it's one-on-one 
or in a group is that it's very repetitive. So if you miss out on something, you can easily catch up because the systems of it are the same. It's very predictable. With the handwriting piece, you're explicitly teaching the letter formation and you're practicing, practicing, practicing. So that kind of addresses that dysgraphia component. You're teaching the pencil grip, you're teaching the letter formation, you're teaching the sound that goes with it. And you don't just ditch it once it's been taught once. You go over it and over it and over it so that that retrieval becomes easier because you're making these connections between these different modalities so that if one is stronger, like maybe the kinesthetic is weak, but maybe the verbal is strong. So every time you're saying something, you're linking it to the pieces that are weaker to help draw that to the forefront. It's also nice kind of with the attention piece because maybe I spaced out and I'm in a group of people, but oh wait, we're spelling the word stack. Oh, we're on add and you just said stack again. Oh, I can catch up. Oh, we're all gonna spell it together. Ooh, I'm, I'm here, I'm ready, I'm going. So a lot of times these structured literacy programs are designed to support students who struggle with maintaining attention, who need support with the handwriting and the letter formation component, and who need that explicit literacy instruction for their struggles with reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there was a follow-up comment um, to that question. And this parent said that um, their child has many different interventions and working memory issues keep him from remembering the letters he's taught in a session. So what feedback would you provide to help that parent? Um, I think that if you're using multiple programs, so like when I think of Slingerland or Foundations or Orton Gillingham, the keyword for the letter E could be elephant, egg, or ed. So I know even as an adult teaching a different program in different settings, I have to think about what is the keyword I'm teaching this group. As a kid who's struggling with retrieval or working memory, if they're like, okay, what setting am I in? Okay, what's my keyword? Now they've just kind of jumbled everything up. So I would say streamlining it and picking one so that it's not like I have to remember three different ways of reading, writing, and spelling. I can remember one and use that tool throughout. All right. I think that is, that's all with the questions. Um, there were, when you were describing some of the different types of structured literacy programs, we mentioned that somebody posted Sunday with the O S O N D A Y. And then somebody else asked, what about phonographics, graphics with the X at the end reading? What about phonographics reading? Is that I something you're familiar with? I'm not familiar with phonographics reading. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a program out there called, ooh, now I can't remember it, but it's like spelling or something else and it's spelled wrong, which is like ironic. Um, but I have not heard of that program. Okay. And I'm sure like all the other ones that have been developed based on the Orton Gillingham model, like your, your infographic was, was wonderful about how you have the, the parent program and then all the little <laughs> offsprings, right? I'm sure that we'll continue to develop other new and novel programs um, just like the other ones have evolved. Yeah. I think uh, as so. long as the person providing the support has good training, and a good understanding and how they need to provide support. I think that's kind of just what you're really looking for. Right, right. 
Yeah. I think you had some excellent tips there about, you know, how to support that and the practice, practice, practice really stood out to me. So like when, when the other question came up about like, if my child's not making progress, that was another thing that you might consider to add into the IEP or talk with the education team is like, how much repetition are they getting? And at what intervals, how, how long are they working with the specialist or with this methodology during the day? You know, how is it being reinforced, reinforced um, over the week, you know, et cetera. 